Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching and listening to the podcast. Tell me your story. This is your host, Chris Baker. And today's special guest is, well, a lot of people call her Murphy, but she goes as Sarah Murphy. And this is her story. And like how I always do, I'll let her say, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Chris. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for asking me to be on today. It's an honor to share my story. Thank you. And I'm honored myself just to have you on and just to hear your story so that you can inspire many others. And who knows, who knows who's going to be touched by this story. But let's just jump into this. Let's talk about your early life, your childhood. Where does it all begin? Okay. Uh, well, I grew up on the west side of Cleveland, um, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I have a younger sister of two years, and we were raised by uh, by our mom. Um, our parents divorced when we were very, very young. I think I was three or four. And after they divorced, um, my dad uh, decided not to come around anymore. I actually haven't seen or heard from him or anyone on his side of the family um, since I've been about four years old. Um, so my mom her parents, um, her her brothers, my Aunt Linda, um, everyone kind of took a hand in, in raising my sister and I. And um, and we went to, to good schools. Uh, we went to Catholic grade school, an all-girl Catholic high school. And um, and then when I graduated, I went to um, our local community college and started studying uh, court reporting. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, so, you know, as I was growing up, I always had, um, I always had a tendency to sort of just get by. And what I mean by that is um, I was a pretty good student without even applying myself. I got good enough grades so that no one questioned what I was doing. Um, but when I was in high school is when, um, when I first started to, to drink and, you know, in high school, I felt like that was sort of everybody started to drink. Everybody was sneaking around and, and going to parties <laughs> and hanging out with the boys. Um, for me, what I noticed at that time was that I actually really enjoyed getting away with things that I was getting away with. I was, I was a good liar, believe it or not. And I, um, I got better at it as I, as I got older and I'm not necessarily proud of that. It's just, I think it's a really important thing to mention, um, for someone in recovery that, um, that that lying, that sort of that, that thrill seeking was one of the first things that I really found myself craving. Um, so after I graduated from high school, I went to, like I said, to Tri-C. I started studying court reporting. I was top of my class. I was 225 words a minute. I won a Rotary Award for how fast I could go. Um, yeah, I was, I was really good. I actually, I loved it actually. Um, but I was drinking a lot during that time. And I used to vacation in Key West. And so the man that I was dating, he and I uh, decided to move to Key West um, without, I didn't graduate from, from college, unfortunately. So I was in a big hurry to, to grow up and do very adult things. So I, I quit college. I moved to Key West. I found a firm that hired me even without the degree. And I did that for a little while. Um, I was 21, 22 years old court reporter in the Keys. And it was, it was great. Um, but then I had a, uh, an idea that I would start bartending in addition to the court reporting. And if you've ever been to Key West, it's a drinking town. And so that's what I did. I, I was bartending and bars were open until 4 a.m. So I was drinking during my shift. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add in like, okay, how are many people, I mean, watching, listening right now. So you're, you drink a lot. You know, you get into that party phase. How many of have you come across the idea that you want to become a bartender? You're like, man, this stuff is easy. Yeah. I, you know, I do pretty good drinking. Yeah. Why not yeah. become it was, a bartender? Um, I like, and then as you were telling me your story just now, yeah. I could tell myself, like, there's a lot of people that come across that. And then when you actually try it out, it's like, not as easy as you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, and you know what the thing for me was that um in the keys and what I was doing, it um it allowed for the lifestyle that I was living, right? I was a very heavy drinker, I was a very heavy drug user, and for me, the bartending allowed that lifestyle, right? And um, and I made a lot of money in Key West. It's like I said, it's a drinking town. I made a lot of money bartending. And eventually I was burning the candles literally on both ends. I'm getting out of the bar at five, six o'clock in the morning, and then I'm having to go to court depositions and do the court reporting. And next thing you know, it was like where I just wasn't sleeping in, on some days. And I can remember being in a deposition and I remember just being so sick and, and so hungover and just 
it was like, you know, th I got, this has got to stop. And I did not mean, I, well, I did not mean the drinking and the drugs. I meant the court reporting. And that's exactly what I did. I, I quit court reporting and I, um, I continued to bartend and I continued that lifestyle. And I lived down in the Keys for about six years um, until I came back to Cleveland. So when I got back to Cleveland, um, you know, my family encouraged me to go back to school and, and, you know, I did so well in it. And I said, yeah, well, I've got the rest of my life to, to grow up. I'm just going to bartend for a little while make a little money, you know, get back on my feet, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I brought, I took me there and I brought me back and what the progression of my alcoholism had really already, you know, taken over. And I would say that by the time I was 35, what used to be really fun was a habit. And then what was a habit turned into an absolute necessity. And at 35 years old, I could no longer function without drugs and alcohol in my system. And, you know, I had managed to be what I thought was a functioning alcoholic. I, I kind of, I, I heard that term a lot in my family. I heard it in society a lot. And I thought if you could just go to work, pay your bills, come home and you drink yourself until you pass out and then you get up and repeat, right? And I don't know that that was like the, uh, the, the grand plan for what my life was, but I had, I had managed to do that for, for quite a long time. I mean, really till I was 35, but my consequences became so unmanageable. So I was showing up to work so drunk that I was fired from three jobs in a matter of months. Wow. And I was very, very sick. I was no longer able to, you know, hair the dog. I'll just drink a little bit more. I was now having to be hospitalized and medically detoxed. And I had pancreatitis and the doc I was in ICU for a few days. And the doctors told me I would not live to see 40 years old. They said, you are, you're so sick, your liver, your kidney, you, you know, and I, I kind of dismissed the medical professionals who told me that I said, Oh, I just, I just drink too much. I'll, I'll do it differently next time. Not even that I'll quit. I just, I'll do it differently next time. Um, but you know, through all of this, I also put my family in a lot of positions to be angry, to be hurt, to be scared for me. And eventually I put them in a position to tell me I was no longer welcome in their lives. I remember the last time I called my mom from the hospital with the pancreatitis and I had waited a few days to call and I finally bit the bullet just to tell her where I was at. And, um, you know, this time she didn't yell at me and she, she didn't cry. She just very calmly said, well, good luck with everything. Um, but you're no longer welcome to call me or to come over. You know, I, there's nothing else I can do. So, so good luck with everything. Thanks. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, I was so selfish back then. I, re I remember my first thought was uh, that that seemed a little harsh, right? That seems a little harsh. Um, but I can understand now the, the fear that I was putting her in and the need for her to protect herself and, and my sister as well. Um so, so that happened. And, and so now I was, um, I no longer had family to call except for my aunt Linda. Um, she kind of, she hung in there with me. Um, but see, that was the thing I was renting from her and my uncle John. And when I got out of the hospital that time, she came over and they told me they were no longer going to enable me. I hadn't been paying bills for a very long time. I was, I was selling the last of whatever I had just to, to buy things from the liquor store. And, uh, and she said, we're not going to enable you anymore and we're not going to bury you. So, um, so you can either pack everything and start walking, go find somewhere else to live, um, or you can get help. You can get some help. And Chris, there was a, a moment, it was in the summertime and there was a moment where I thought, oh, I could go to this friend's house for a little while. I could go to that friend's house for a little while. But, but to be honest, I was so tired. There, there's this saying we have where you, you know, you get so sick and tired of being sick and tired and, um, and that's really where I was at. I mean, it was just like, something's got to give here. Um, so there was a woman who I used to drink with a long time ago. And she got sober at a place called the Edna House. And she had been trying to take me to meetings. Um, the problem when I would go to 12-step to meetings was that I was so afraid to go into a room of people. I didn't know that I would drink before the meeting to get a little courage. Um, sometimes I take a little something in my bottle and drink during the meeting and then even though it makes absolutely no sense, I would reward myself for going to a meeting by having a drink. Um, so I needed something a little bit more than, than meetings. 
And she kept encouraging me to call call the Edna house. She said, they'll help you. And I said, yeah, but I don't have anything. Like I haven't been able to work in a long time. I have no health insurance. I have no money. Like I said, I'm selling the last of whatever I have in the house just to, to stand outside the liquor store waiting for them to open. And, uh, and she said, Murphy, call them. And, uh, and when I did, I remember the lady on the phone talking to me and she was so nice. And I explained my situation and she said, we can help. And I said, but maybe you didn't hear me. I, I don't have anything. There's no, there's nothing I can offer you. I don't have a single penny to my name. And she said, that's okay. You can come. And um, I remember packing some clothes and my Aunt Linda took me down. And I remember being very, very fearful of what it was going to be like. And, and how are the other women going to be? And what was this going to be like? And I'm giving up drinking. And how do you even celebrate anymore if you don't drink? Do you even have birthdays if you're sober? Those kinds of things. Um, so I got to the Edna house and I remember walking in the back door and I remember hearing so many women laughing. They were, they were like, they were happy and they were laughing and they said things to me like, welcome home. And at that time wow. there were I was the, I was the fifth Sarah that walked in that door. Right. So when I said my name was Sarah, they said, nope, no, 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 no. We already have four Sarahs. So that's how, and Murph has kind of always been a, a nickname, but that's how, that's why everyone just calls me Murphy. Because as soon as I walked in, they said, nope, we can't have one more Sarah. So you're Murphy, you're Murph. And that's how that stuck. Um, but they said, welcome home. And I got a shower and they got me something to eat and they showed me where my bed is. And, um, those first 90 days we spend in, in, we call it the attic. It's on the third floor and there's 25 beds up there and it's all an open dorm style living area. And the reason for that is uh, women in early sobriety were, were very emotional, were, were very fearful and we tend to want to isolate. Mm -hmm. And having that open floor plan, it allows for the other women to be aware of each other. And I remember on some of my hardest days when I would sit there and just cry and say, I, I don't know if I really am going to do this anymore. These women would come over and they'd surround me and they'd say, Murph, yes, you can. Yes, you can do this. And, you know, when, when I mentioned that I had been a functioning alcoholic, but then I eventually stopped paying bills. And one of the problems was, is that I didn't know how to be sober enough to go to work to pay bills. But if I went to work to pay bills, I had to drink because I couldn't function without it. It was like this. I, I didn't know how to balance the two anymore. So what the Edna house gave me was the opportunity to take away all of those fears. And all they said to me was you follow the rules, you make your bed, you do your chores and you, you get better. And we'll just take care of everything else. And of course, that's what happened. So when I would wake up, I didn't have to worry anymore about looking over and seeing if the fan was running because that meant they didn't shut the electricity off. And I didn't have to check the faucet anymore to see if they shut the water off. Like all those basic things, they were provided for me. And when I went downstairs, there was coffee and, and more food than I could ever imagine. Was there no one, no one at the end of the house has ever gone hungry. In fact, we don't even buy food. All of our food is donated through the Cleveland community, the West Side Market, um, people have have parties and, and weddings and they show up with prepared food and say this is all left over and, and we take it right so all of these things were provided for me and I'd go to groups and groups are Monday through Saturday from nine to three and you get a break in between each group and the facilitators were women in the recovery community and alumni of the house who said I know what it's like to be in your shoes and I'm here to help you and so each group is like, is like a class and it's life lessons. And it's, this is how you live a sober life. And this is how you, how you get to be a sober member of society today. And, um, and little by little, I started to get better. I, I got a sponsor. I started working. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, okay. let Sorry. me <laughs> ask a question as you're getting more into okay. the story. I want to ask, sure. so how, when you, when you first arrived, how were you, mm -hmm. how exactly were you feeling? Oh gosh. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I had never known a life without drinking and drugs. And now I was trying to make a decision to give that up. And and it's kind of like, I think for, for normal people, they just say, well, just stop doing it. But I didn't understand that alcoholism was a mental obsession and a physical craving. I didn't understand. I didn't really understand that, that the disease of alcoholism. So when I'm going there and, you, and you're asking me to totally change my life at the age of 35 and totally give up all the old people that I used to hang out with and do all of these things, it was terrifying. And I was angry too. I was angry. I went to a good school. I have a good family. 
I, this was never the plan. I said, why, why is, why is this even happening to me? This is so unfair. This is so unfair. I, this should not be happening. So at this time you were what, about 10 years into it or how long were you drinking? Like when was the last um, time you were sober at to this point? At, as of today? No, or when, at, the at day? that oh. time. Um, I had been sober for about 10 days. I had gotten out of the hospital. Um, I called the Edna house. There was a little bit of a wait at that time because it was, it was full. So we had to wait for a bed to come available. So I was about 10 days sober at that time at 35 years old. And how long was it before then? Was it like 10 years? I don't remember the last time I even drew a sober breath from probably the age of 18 I might have taken a I might have taken a, a day or two off to nurse a terrible terrible hangover but for the most part I was consistently taking some sort of mind altering substance always so going into this man I could only like like you said you were just kind of were you in disbelief of like is this really going to help me am I really yeah, oh my gosh my way yeah oh absolutely I said I don't know if this is I I I don't know I don't know if this is going to work or not. You know, the, the little bit of hope that I had was the woman who her name is Nina and she's an amazing, beautiful woman. I get emotional sometimes when I think about it. Um, she was living this beautiful life and I wanted that so bad. And I had had a little bit of hope that if it worked for her, that it would work for me. And like I said, when I got there, these women, they were so happy. I, I can't remember the last time I had just been so genuinely happy in a really, really long time. So it was, it was the, just the vibe in the house, the spirits in the house and the hope that I could have a life like she had one day and, and just, and just be happy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so that's what I did. I, I stayed. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly, I did very well being told what to do for me. When I, when they said to me, you're up at a certain time, you make your bed, you do your chore, and then you go to meditation and you go to groups and you gotta be on time and on time is five minutes early. Um, even when I was waiting for, for you to come on today, I, I was 15 minutes early, just sitting here waiting because I just have been taught like on time is actually early, right? If, if I showed up at 10 o'clock for the podcast today, I feel like that would be late. Um, so they taught me things like that. Right. And, and so now for work, I'd rather be 30 minutes early than a minute late. Right. I'm when my boss, I start at nine. And when my boss says to me, Murph, are you looking at that email at nine? I, I absolutely am. I'm not walking in the door at nine and taking off my coat and get my coffee. I'm, I'm really ready to work. I give 110% today because that's what I was taught to do there. Right. Um, and I'm probably getting a little ahead of myself, but, but to go back to when I was there. So I, I started, um, I started working through the 12 steps. I got a sponsor. I started to get better. I started to get better little by little. Right. My disease will be with me forever. There is no destination. There is no cure. There is, oh, I've finally arrived. Now I can stop going to meetings and doing all of those things. This is, I just have a lot of tools that I use today. So as I got better, um, I went through our job development program. After 90 days, every woman goes to the job skills. And that is where you either update or learn to write a resume, get a professional email, mock interviews, um, and I started working my first full-time corporate job while I worked at the Edna House. I had health insurance for the first time. I never never really had proper health insurance. I didn't even know how to pick a health insurance plan, right? Um, I started to pay my taxes. I had a lot of tax issues that I had to deal with once I got sober. I actually had to go to criminal court for that. They're going to throw me in jail for, for taxes. And um, I have a, a dear friend who sat down with me um, my first three years of sobriety and did taxes with me. And now I know how to do my taxes. And every year I will text her and just say, hey, I, I just did my taxes, <laughs> you know, just to, to tell her because it means so much to me. She spent all that time with me. Um, and eventually, Chris, my my family came back around. Uh, my mom was willing to see me again. And, and that was the thing. I, I remember when I was at Edna, I kept saying, I want to, I want to call my mom. I'm going to tell her what I'm doing. And I'm going to tell her how it's going to be different this time. And I'm going to tell her and I'm going to tell her. And the women said, you don't get to tell her anything. She made it perfectly clear and set a boundary that she doesn't want to talk to you right now. So the only thing you can do is show her through your actions 
that it's different this time. And, and that's what I did. And she saw that. She saw that. And eventually I was able to sit down with my mom at the table and make proper amends. Pause, with her. pause, pause, pause. Okay. <laughs> Throw the flag out there real quick. Okay. I'm just saying to myself, as you were just telling me just that, okay, you're recovering. You're, you're, you're feeling good about yourself. The first person you want to go to is your folks. You want to mm-hmm. tell the family that, yeah. like, hey, look, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. But what they are teaching you is the right thing to do is like, no, 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 don't, don't, you know, sh- you know, tell them, show them, okay. show them. And that's like so important. And like, I'm just thinking for whoever's watching, listen right now, that is so important because how often do we say something like, yeah, I'm doing so much better. And then we mm-hmm. fall back into that run. Like we can fall back into that mistake. But if yes. we're out here proving to people and showing people like, no, I'm good now. And I like that. Yeah. I mean, that's take note of that, guys. Yeah, it really is. Don't just talk about it. You got to be about it. You know, you got to really, really put the actions behind it. And um, and that's that's what I did. And I'm so grateful that the Edna House is a place where it's women helping women. And, you know, at the time when when I was told that I wasn't welcome in their lives anymore by my mom and my sister, both individually told me that, I remember that I thought that that was terrible. And how could this be happening? And I miss them so much. I, I did. I was, I was so mad and so upset. Um, but hindsight, um, I can look at it now, Chris, and see that that was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. I can't imagine what it was like. I don't have children myself, um, but I can't imagine what it was like for my mom to tell her firstborn daughter you are no longer welcome in my life. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I that's why I take ownership of that. I say I put my family in a position, right? I put them in a position to tell me that based on my actions, right? So so to be able to, to really come from a circle, to have them um, back in my life, to to be a big part of my family, like they, they like to have me around now. It's... Uh, you know, I'm welcome over their house again. And they just came over to my house and we do things together today. And that's what, um, for me, working through these 12 steps and making a decision to let God run my life has done for me. Um, I worked at that corporate job for for quite a while. Um, I lived at the Edna house for almost eight months. And when I moved out, um, I had that job still. Um, I was a very active volunteer. I would go back and pick up the ladies and take them to outside 12-step meetings. Um, I would facilitate group. And uh, we have an alumni association. The Edna Alumni Association are some of the most amazing women I have ever met in my entire life. We are all women who graduated from the program and continues um, to maintain our sobriety. So the first Thursday of every month, we get together, we have a meeting about how things are going at the house, we take the residents out um, on outings, you know, our our world is so small, when we're drinking and using drugs, so we take them out in Cleveland, and we show them the art museum, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and picnics at the beach, and Christmas lights, and things that they've never seen before, or experienced sober, and it's the most beautiful thing to see a woman who will stand in the art museum, who Instead of being in prison, she's at the Edna house and she's, she's crying and she's saying, I can't wait to bring my kids here, you know? So I served as president of our alumni association for two years. And that position um, allows for a voting count on the board of directors. So not only was I a former resident, now I'm an alumni, president of the alumni association, and I get to sit with the other board of directors and I had a voting count. I remember they would they would vote and I'd look over at the chair, Aaron, and I'd say, are you sure I'm allowed to vote? And I'd, you know, I'd vote with everybody. It was one of the coolest things that, that I got to do. I love being a part of something that is so big and so important. And that's actually how I met um, our current executive director, Jen Lasky. And Jen and I did some volunteer work together and I'd go and speak about the Edna House and share a little bit of my story with her and different organizations. Um, while I was still working that corporate job, um, I was in a motorcycle accident. I actually, so quick story on um, the lady who helped me do my taxes. She's ridden Harleys her whole entire life. I get sober and she says, Murphy, you want to take the, the motorcycle class? So there was a, a bunch of us girls who went, we 
uh, took a class at Polaris to learn how to ride motorcycles. I loved it. It came so natural to me. Um, I've had a cafe racer, a couple Yamahas. I have my, my first Harley now. Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's really cool. Me, that's what me and my girlfriends do. We ride Harleys now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. So unfortunately about three, about four years ago, I was in a, in an accident though. And it, um, I had broken my arm and a lot of complications. So I couldn't return to my job and I started doing couple different things. And I kept saying to God, what is that I'm supposed to be doing with my life here? Like, I remember being so angry that the accident happened and I was dotting the I's and crossing the T's and why, why is this happening to me? I always say that to God, why is this happening to me? And he's always got these plans that I wish I could just, I wish I could have a little foresight into, but um, what ended up happening was when I, I mean, don't was we praying, all know. Don't we all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just show me something because I know you got a plan, but please, what for me, we just speed the time up a little bit, you know. Um, but I was praying, I said, God, what is it I'm supposed to do? And I, Chris, I swear to you, my phone rang and it was Jen Lasky, and she said, Murph, I have a position at the Edna house that I think you would be great for. And it was I just get paid to talk about Edna and my experience. I used to say that actually, right? So, um, so I have keys to the back door now. And every day when I go and I get to hear these women pray, I get to hear them struggle. I get to hear them laugh. I get to see them go through the halls and I get to see them when they first walk in, just like I did with their head down and shame and embarrassment and fear. And as they stay, as I stayed, we start to hold our heads up a little bit higher and we start to smile and we start to laugh and we start to look each other in the eyes and we start to see that there is this whole other life that we never knew was even possible. Once we start letting the other women in the program and God and each other lift each other up. I mean, that's, that's really why this house is so beautiful. It's these other women. It, it's all the women who came before me that said, Murph, this is how you do it, right? I'm not reinventing the wheel. So everything that these women taught me, I'm trying to instill in them so that they can instill in the women who have yet to even come through our doors, you know? And we, when I was first hired, I was, I was helping Jen. We were writing handwritten thank yous and she's writing grants and we're about to launch this capital campaign because we just bought the Edna House, which is in a housed in a former convent, and the school building next to it. So there's these big plans, right? So we have to come up with this $1.25 million in order to do the upgrades and the renovations that we need for the phase three over in the school building. So we actually took classes on how to raise this money and we were ready to go. And then Chris, what happened? COVID. And everybody said, no, no, you can't come in here now. You can't, we can't have people coming into our buildings and everybody stopped working in, in their workplaces and they're at home. And we had to, we had to kind of take a break for that for just a minute. And, you know, just I didn't minute. even think about that till just now, because yeah. I, I don't think anybody really thinks about it. Like COVID shut down everything, shut down everything. So I'm, Oh, wow. That really kind of gets me thinking now. It's like, wow. So you get all these people that are trying to recover from addictions and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it's cut off. Yeah. And that's where, and that was one of the things it was sort of, it was a very funny time if, if you are in the addiction field or, or if you look at it from the perspective of, so we have all the women who are at the house and we can have up to 47 women in, in the house, in the Edna house, we have 25 beds upstairs. And then once you go through the job development program um, and you get a job, then you come down and you get your own room and we have 22 bedrooms. So 25 and 22. So we had to, you know, everyone's closing businesses. So our residents had stopped working and we told them, you got to stop working. We're going to put all the program fees on hold. You get to stay here and be safe. So we only had to close our doors for, I would say about three weeks. Um, but, you know, during that time, a lot of people were receiving the, the COVID stimulus relief funds. And, you know, I'll just be honest, if, if I would have still been drinking during that time and gotten money, I would have looked at it like I was getting paid to stay at home and drink and do drugs. Well, pretty much, because if you look at it like yeah. during that time period, when we're still kind of we're still in it, we're not completely out of it. Mm -hmm. But during that time period. A lot of people were in fear. A lot of people thought the world was coming to an end. Yeah. So what we try to do, if you're not connected to God, 
we try to fill something with that void, that hole. Yeah. Like I said, if you were still an addict, you were going to automatically would get in a stimulus check. You're about to get some beer. You're about to get something to, something to help you, to satisfy you, to relax your nerves. And you're probably not the only one that was thinking that, too. And then- oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, yeah, so we we closed our doors. Uh, we actually managed to go all year, what was that, 2020, um, without a single case of COVID until the day after Christmas when I think everybody but three people got it. Um, but we had just enough bedrooms to everyone was able to safely spend time. Um, you know, that was back in the old days when you did 14 days of quarantine and um, everyone had their their own room. And so the staff and the three residents who did not have COVID, um, we were in charge of making sure everyone ate and had a little bit of a phone time and was able to go out and smoke. It was, you know, there was no handbook for when these kinds of things happened. So at that time we were, we were coming up with it as it was happening. We were coming up with protocol. This is how we're going to handle it. We're going to do it. Um, and we made it through. And eventually we started bringing people to the end of the house when it was safe and we were giving them tours and we got our first $100,000 donation. Then we got another 100000 Then we would get a 50000 <laughs> And we raised $1.25 million in a matter of a year, year and a half. And we were able to go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. We were able to go ahead and start the construction in the school building. And so what that is, it's the Edna House Residence and Education Center. On the first floor, we continue to do our GED program. So any woman who comes through without a high school diploma or GED will get one while she's at the Edna House. Um, Our job development program our wellness center uh, where the ladies do yoga once or twice a week. We have um, a conference room over there now and our infinite hope room is where the ladies will do uh, groups or if they have uh, children's visits, they'll go over there and do that. And then on the second floor, we took these very large classrooms, divided them into two and they are longer term living suites. So we can have 10 women once they complete six to nine months in the Edna house they have the option to move next door. You know, you're really only working months five and six and, and, you know, so forth. So that's not a lot of time to save up money, clear up the wreckage of your past, get your affairs in order. So this allows for a little bit more time um, without us just overseeing you so much. And that has been instrumental in the lives of these women too. We have one, one woman who is enrolled back in school Uh, We have one woman who's able to save up enough money. She just moved out and got her own place. Um, One woman is going through her physical therapy sessions while she's starting to work and still continuing her GED classes. So it's really just, it's it's a step up and a step down. It's a step down that is that, again, we're not overseeing you so much, but it's really just a step up to continue the life of being a sober woman in the Cleveland community now. It's beautiful. Okay. Okay. But so during this time period, what was like the real obstacles, the adjustments that had to be made in order for it to make it possible to keep bringing people back in during the COVID time? Hmm. So at that time we had to, you know, we were, everyone was wearing masks, but then if you remember, there was a period of time where people couldn't get masks, right? So we had to reach out to different organizations and they were making masks for us. And then we have hand sanitizers, but to be honest, sometimes we were like, well, we shouldn't be putting out alcohol filled hand sanitizers. You know, you kind of have to be careful with what, what you allow. Um, Meetings were shut down because churches were shut down. So that meant we had to bring zoom into the Edna house. Well, there's not a lot of time for television. Our ladies are constantly working on step work and doing different things. So the alumni, um, again, who are just the most amazing women, we, we put it out to them. We need a smart TV. Everyone donated money. We had over $500. We went to, to Sam's Club, got a big TV, right? So now we're bringing Zoom in. When we quarantined, every we didn't, had to get everyone tablets. We don't have tablets. So we had a grant. We, we took that money. We went and bought tablets for everyone. Well, then the internet wasn't strong enough. So then we had to get Spectrum in there to upgrade the internet. And it's a very old brick building. It's a convent. So you have to take into consideration some of those rooms aren't getting the the, the fee that they should. And so it was a lot of, um, oh, that happened. Okay, let's do this. Then that happened. We got to, let's try it this way. And again, it was, um, how do you feed 22 women 
safely, right? Because everyone was supposed to be so far. So we had, again, we had to, we'd make the food and then it was taken up and we'd put them on trays outside their doors. Um, we had bathroom shifts. We had smoking shifts. Uh, we wanted these women to still be able to call family and their sponsors, check in with their kids. So we'd bring them downstairs in shifts to use the phone and then everything had to be sanitized. It was, it was kind of a crazy time when we just rolled with it literally minute by minute because every time we thought we had it all right we're good now we can sit back for a minute you know something else would would come up you know we had to stop taking clothing donations for for a long time as well and we the Cleveland community loves to bring us their clothes and, and food so it was again it was a lot of not just what we're doing in the house but we had to adapt to the fact that everyone else was closing or they weren't doing their normal you know business. And I'm thinking just in that time period, man, just, like you said, just as soon as you thought you had it, you're like, all right, we yeah. got it down. We got, we got it good now. Now you got to make yeah. an adjustment to something else. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are so blessed that we have a leader like Jen Lasky and she just, she kept us all going and we, staff showed up every Welcome back from the commercial break, everybody. I just want to simply um, just put it out there. So if you guys are recovering or you're an addict yourself and you want to get help and you were touched by the commercial you just saw, go ahead, Murphy. I'll let you take over. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the uh, the Edna House for Women, uh, we're located on the west side of Cleveland. Um, in order to come to, to the Edna House, um, it's a really simple um, admittance uh, procedure. So really you just have to call the number 216-281-7751 and just admit that you need help. And uh, a staff member will be able to, to assist you with that. Um, Ashley is the one who's in charge of bringing all of our new residents in. So I uh, will most likely get you through to her, but if she's not available, myself, Jen, Carla, one of us will talk to you. And um, we're just going to ask you some questions. We're going to talk to you about your medications, any legal charges pending, none of which um, is going to stop you from coming. We work directly with the courts. A lot of uh, Trumbull County residents come up, uh, their judges send them to the Edna House. They know that we're a great program. So really all that you need to come to the Edna House is the willingness to say, I want a different life. We're going to ask you to do things that might seem a little abnormal. We we're going to ask you to get up by 7 a.m. We're going to have you have your bed made by 8 a.m. You're going to be in meditation by 8.30 a.m. Um, but the reason for all of this is it's to prepare you for everyday life. You know, once you're up and you're dressed for the day, you're downstairs in groups all day. There's no going back upstairs and laying down. Um, 
my boss doesn't let me take naps <laughs> during the day. Sometimes I wish he would let me, but we, you know that's that's why we have everything set up and structured a way that it's getting everyone prepared for what real life is. And we have beds available and we have resources. And just like I shared in the very beginning of my story, I literally had no money. And I had the clothes on my back and a few other things, but um, but the Edna House has the hygiene products, the toiletries, the Cleveland community supports us and makes sure that our residents have whatever they need as they start their new life. Um, let me mention that we do, after three years of having to put our, we have two major fundraisers every year. And after three years of having to put um, our big St. Patrick's Day celebration on hold because of COVID, this year we're back in person. So our fundraiser is going to be March 11th and it's going to be at the UAW Hall. You can check out our website. Tickets will start going on sale February 1st, um, but we have sponsorship and ad um, opportunities. And also it's a, it's a corned beef sandwich dinner. Um, but what's really exciting to share, in addition to this fundraiser that's going to help us with our operating costs, is that the Cleveland community has supported the Edna House, and we have a Cleveland landmark celebrating us. Um, our colors are purple and gold, and on March 11th, the Terminal Tower will be lit up purple and gold in honor of the Edna House. So make sure you check that out. Say what? Yeah, I know. Oh, we're excited. So that's why check us out. Facebook, Instagram. I'm on got the Edna House Twitter account up and running now. So we're going to constantly uh, be putting updates and shout outs on there. But March 11th, just remember that at the Cleveland community is celebrating the recovery that happens at the Edna House for Women. So, OK, before we were before we went to commercial break, you were beginning to talk about how like if you're a leader, Jen, if she wasn't in charge, man, none of that would have been possible. She guys kept you afloat and she taught you how to just keep rolling with the oh, punches, yeah. man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, um, all the women who have led at the Edna House have kept the Edna House going. We are coming up on our 19th anniversary, uh, February 2nd. We'll be celebrating 19 years of recovery in the C Cleveland community. Um, and when Jen Lasky came in as executive director about five years ago, um, she just, she elevated the standard for the women. And I, every time we would do these tours and we would we would talk about the renovations and the upgrades that we we're gonna do to the house. She she had this line and she would always tell everybody, I'm not trying to make this look like the Taj Mahal, but for the safety, support, and dignity of our ladies, we need some improvements in here. So Chris, well, like when I was a resident there in 2015, there were drawers and cabinets missing in the kitchen. And for me, it was just like, ah, well, I don't know where they ever, I don't know why there was never a drawer and on some of those things in the kitchen. And we had our donor come through and he, he was our first $100,000 donor. And he, he came through and he was in the kitchen and he's looking around and he said, is, is this a work in progress? And Jen said, no, this is, this is the kitchen. And so he kind of chuckled a little bit. Um, and actually funny story about that. And I usually don't share this, um, but funny story about that is uh, he called Jen that weekend and he told Jen, me and my wife are going to be making this donation to the end of the house. And we want you to tell Murphy that this is in honor of her mom who got her daughter back. And so I see now okay. that the Edna House returns women to their families, sober, strong, and law abiding. And um, I remember when she called me that Sunday afternoon and I'm crying. And then I called my mom crying and then she was crying. And it was just, um, it was just a very, very beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, so yeah, so Jen has really Jen and and people follow Jen, right? People have followed the Edna House for years, and we have those supporters. We love them. Jen also has a group of people that have followed her through her career. She's a former parole officer. She ran a men's reentry program. Um, Jen's very involved in her church, and so the people that follow Jen believe in her, and they believe in the mission of the Edna House now. And so when people will say, "Well, what do the ladies need?" Right? We I mentioned we go to the West Side Market. We go to Sanson Produce on Wednesdays. Uh, we have different organi organizations that will come and drop off produce, things like that. But sometimes like what we don't get are condiments. We don't get salad dressings. And then ladies don't ask for that. Um, so Jen will say, tell her people like, well, we need some salad dressings, right? And they don't show up with a couple bottles, Chris. They show up with a couple cases. They show up with carloads of things for our residents. They show up like her brother and sister-in-law who would never tell anybody that they did this. They, um, they know our ladies don't get ground beef a lot. And so they make sure that they bring monthly ground beef and hamburger buns and taco stuff. And it's just because our residents do all the cooking too. We don't pay 
licensed social workers. We don't pay, pay any cooks. We don't pay cleaners. Our residents put in, they have major clean Monday and they have to do a chore every day and they put some time, this is their home. It's it's their investment into their future, right? And so um, I remember when, when I was a cook there and we had to, we kind of called it Edna Chopped and it was like, we really, we don't have a grocery list. So it was, you had to prepare for everybody in the house lunch and dinner and you use whatever you had and you, you cooked a lot of food and it wasn't always necessarily one big conducive meal. Sometimes it was hot dogs and salads and eggs and <laughs> like a lot of different things, but, but everybody ate and nobody has ever gone hungry. You know, we have more food than, than we need sometimes. So now, um, now so tell me, tell me, are you, do you like to cook? Are you a big time? Cooker? I do. For me, I, I do myself. Okay. I got to prepare a meal for the entire house. And me, I like I like putting my heart and soul into the like any dish I make. Yeah. In a way, when you know whoever's enjoying my dish, I'm just like yes. I always, I always, like, I'm always like asking people like even afterwards, like how was it? Was it good? Did you like it? Mm -hmm. Did you love it? And I got to make yeah. sure like it was you know top notch because as they say, oh this could have been a little bit better. I'm like okay, I'll make that a little bit better next time. But I want it to be mm -hmm. perfect every time. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, if you're preparing a meal, you can go to the grocery store, you can get all your seasonings and everything that you want. These ladies can't do that. They have to make do with whatever they have in the house. And so that's where that kind of comes into play. And you, you'll have women who have never made a grilled cheese before who are learning how to do that. And then you've got other people whose grandma showed them how to do things and, and they're the teachers. So, um, so it's really, and there's no dishwasher Our ladies wash and dry and and fellowship and it's it's a program it's beautiful so please do share with us what was your first meal and also if anybody's wondering it's just water it's just water <laughs> so the first meal that i cooked while i was there uh we had italian sausage all the time when i was there so it was big salads macaroni and cheese and it was italian sausage that we used to cook in this crock pot and it would cook all day and we put it in at the time when the kitchen was so old, we would put our crock pots in the chapel and cook the Italian sausage in there. And it was mac and cheese and salad. Oh, I remember man, that. that sounds yeah. delicious. <laughs> yeah, it was until you started eating it every day. And then you'd kind of go, oh my gosh, I'm done with Italian sausage. But again, it was like, it was food. And, and we were, we were grateful that the community would donate what they could. And so nothing goes to waste, you know? And well, that's, that's how I always look at it too. It's like, I, I was up, you know, up. my upbringing, whatever you get, man, make the most of it, like food wise, mm -hmm. because not everybody has like all these different choices. And like you said, you get tired of eating the same stuff, but hey, yeah. at least you're eating, at least you're being fed. Yeah. And like you said, yeah. you're probably getting tired of the same meals every day, but you got to make use of it because that's what you got. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you allowed to share the 12 steps at all? Or is that kind of like a sacred thing? Um, well, the 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 12 step program that we use, um, we just it's we don't that that program doesn't endorse or oppose any one organization. And so for anonymity purposes, we just don't talk about um, a lot of our of our stuff. We just kind of keep it um keep it quiet. It's part of our traditions that uh, we don't announce it on press, radio, film. You probably have heard that before. And that's why I just stick to saying a 12 step program. And I'm sure everyone knows which one I'm talking about. Um, but, um, but I'm not the face of that program. I just happen to be a very, very grateful recovering alcoholic who is a part of a, we and part of a member of that amazing group that has saved lives, who has, been a foundation and who has um, just significantly changed the lives of not just the alcoholic, but the families who are affected by the alcoholic. Now, throughout this entire journey, what is the, the lessons that you have learned and what is your advice mm -hmm. for others? All right. So um, gratitude is an action. Gratitude is an action. I can't just say I'm grateful for it. And then my actions don't back it up. I have to show my gratitude every day. And I do that by saying my prayers and talking to my sponsor and all of my, my support group who are my friends. Um, I do that by giving 110% at work, by loving my family, um, really by being of utmost service to God. That is today, my, my earthly job is at the Edna House, but really God is my employer today. And I am here to be of service to him. Um, and 
I try to trust. God has plans for me that I don't understand and I don't always like them. So I try to trust. I try because I say I trust, but you know, when you throw in that, but it kind of negates everything you just said. Right. So I say, I, I trust God. I just have to, to trust in his timing. Um, so that's a struggle for me. I think that's a struggle for a lot of people. You know, we, we trust God. I, I have evidence in my life that he has been with me all along and has protected me so far. I have no reason to believe that he doesn't love me and have best intentions for me. I just don't see as a human. I just don't see it sometimes. Right. But how often so do I, we do that? How often oh, do we, you know, we fully trust yeah. God. But as soon yeah. as things start going our way, I said this before in the past, we have things going our way. Mm-hmm. And as soon as things start going our way, what do we do? We say, I got it from here. Yep. I'm going my way. And then as, I'm soon, good. as yeah. soon as we do that, we're like, thanks, Lord. Thanks. I can do it from yeah. here. And as soon as we do that, we let go of the hand and start mm-hmm. walking with our own plan. Before you know it, we're like, what's happening? Why isn't everything happening like it used to be? But what's, thing, what's, what's awesome about God is no matter what, he's always there with his arms open wide. Mm-hmm. saying come back i got more yeah. for you allow me to yeah. direct you and lead you every step of the way i have a plan for you yes yes plans to prosper you not to harm you you know um, you know. <laughs> yeah so so i think for anyone who is listening who is struggling who is who is contemplating or thinking about a 12-step program or getting sober or anything like that If you are willing to do it, if you are willing to just say, I'm willing to take the suggestions, even if, even if you're not even, I remember when I first got to the Edna house and I had some level of faith, but I kind of thought God was for the people who, who did good. Right. I I wasn't sure that God really wanted to talk to me and the women there taught me how to pray. Right. So even if you're, you're struggling with the concept of God or, or your faith, it's just, are you willing to give this a try? Are you willing to take the suggestions from another person? Because it's going to be against the grain of what we normally do, right? I know I used to be the kind of person that just ran. I threw up my hands and said, I'm not doing this. Just forget it, right? But when I sat in the uncomfortableness, that's when I grew as a person. That's when I grew in my faith. I grew mentally, spiritually, emotionally. That's when things started to change is when I got through the uncomfortableness. And what's beautiful thing about what you just said just there, Is in order to grow in life, you have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to go into the uncomfortable. Because that's the only way you'll grow in this life. Absolutely. No better way to put it, right? Absolutely. You got that right. So what are your future plans? And um what's 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 the goals next? What's what's next? Ooh, that's what we've been talking about, Chris. So short-term goals. We're gonna have a major successful fundraiser in March. Okay. Um after that, after that, that's what we've been talking about. We who knows what God has in store for us. I think that the unique approach that the Eden House takes, um, we are 12 step based, abstinent based recovery. And I think that the 19 years of being in the Cleveland community has proven that what we do, our model works. And so we are, we think that we should be a, um, a pilot program for other organizations around the country to, to take what we do so well based on the founders who are four women in recovery themselves. These are four women in recovery themselves who said, where does a woman go when she wants to get sober, but she doesn't have a safe place to do it? And that's how the Edna House came to be. So how do we take the idea and the dream of these four amazing, strong women and share that? Well, we can be the pilot program. So so me and Jen have some things that we've been talking about. So you'll see. Got stuff up your sleeves. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> All right. We're outside of the Edna House. What are your mm-hmm. personal interests and hobbies? Ooh. Personal interests and hobbies. So right now I am taking a neighborhood leadership development program that has been instrumental in raising the bar in my uh, in my career. Um, it is sort of grooming me for what I think is to be the future. And it's uh, run by uh, former Cleveland mayor, Mike White. So just to be in the presence of, of people like him and and our other coaches there, um, it's just been instrumental. So I love 
that class. And I love to tell you that I love to learn. And that to me is something that is so exciting. Um, I told you I ride a Harley. So anytime it is nice out, you will find me on my Harley. You will find me um, at Edgewater Park. Um, and I love to be with my family and, and my friends. That's that's what I do. We, we ride Harleys. We go out to eat. We go different places, go see a movie. Um, I just started going to the theater again, which has actually been pretty cool. So uh, we just went and saw Beetlejuice um, that's playing at Playhouse Square. So yeah, I don't know. Anything, pretty much anything that I'm asked to do, um, I will try at least once because I get to live life today. And if I don't like it, then I have to say, you know what, that's okay. At least I tried it, right? Yes. But um, I feel like everything <laughs> I, I keep trying, I love because it's like, what else can I do? What else is out there? Let me try it. What's next, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so um, let's do some fun facts. Ooh. Question number one. Dog okay. or cats? Cats. Cats. Number two, if you could go anywhere in the world, where are you going? Hmm. I'm going to Hawaii. Why Hawaii? Yeah, Hawaii. Uh, I love the beach. So having lived in Key West and I used to snorkel down there, um, I want to go where the, the beaches are beautiful. The sand is soft. I, I just, I, everything I've ever seen about Hawaii is I want to be there. All right, number three, I'll make it kind of a challenge for you. A little, little bit more <laughs> okay. of a challenge. Okay. If you weren't working for the Edna House, if you weren't in there, mm -hmm. where would you be? What other mm -hmm. job could you be doing? If I was not at the Edna House. And I'm not trying to steal it from anybody. So anybody that works there, I'm not trying to steal her. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, we were just, no, my, my heart is with the Edna House. Um, I will be there as long as they'll have me. Um, if I was not there, where I think my ideal dream job would be, um, I would love to have, I would love to have therapy dogs actually, and go to the different hospitals and schools. And I remember I read an article one time about children who have learning disabilities, learning to read by reading to the dogs. Dogs don't um, criticize or correct children, right? So they feel more comfortable talking to dogs, really. So I would like to use anything that would be helpful to people. Um, so that's what I always say. Like if I won the lottery, that would be something that I would do too, is I would I would have these therapy dogs and do that um, or make a wish foundation. I think that would be a beautiful place to be able to work to, to do that for people. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, as we wrap this thing up, um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, thank you very much for having me on. And thank you for everyone who listened, who may have an interest in the Edna House. If you would please remember that I, in 2023, I want the Edna House to be on the tip of everyone's tongue when they think of recovery for women. We do not even take health insurance. Even if you have it, we're not going to take it. So whether it's you that's struggling or your daughter or your sister or your wife, someone knows someone who is struggling with this. So please call the Edna House, talk to a staff member. There is help available. Even when you think, yeah, but I have nothing, we are exactly the place for you. Murphy, I just want to say, I love your story. Love that you Thank came you. on and shared it on this, this platform, this podcast. Thank you. But truly, I mean, just everything that you, you've gone through, you dealt with, all those battles, all the obstacles, even the, the motorcycle accident itself. Yeah. I'm just blessed to have you on the show, just to have you, just to hear your story. And I know without a doubt, whoever's listening right now, I know it inspired you. I know it probably moves you and helps you and helps you understand that the battle that you're facing, you are not alone. That, yeah. you know, others have dealt with the same battle. And that if you go to the Edna house, like she said, Mer, that you're not just going to go on there with people that have no experience of what they're talking about. These mm -hmm. people are here to help you. And they're going to get you to where you need to be in life. Not just help you with recovery, but get you back on your feet. Help you get moving you into the right direction. And I bet, like Murph could say, even say to herself, when she went to the recovery house, did she see herself becoming part of the, the recovery house? Did she see herself doing talks about it? But God works in mysterious ways. And you see it firsthand today on this show. And anybody else that you know, that's listening and watching right now. Also, I'd like to add that if you want to come on and tell your story, just like how Sarah Murphy did, 
feel free to contact me. I put a little description, little my email down in the description, I should say. <laughs> Other than that, this is Chris, your podcast host. So tell me your story. This is Sarah Murphy, or, or you could just say Murph. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for today. But if uh, before I sign up, Murph, if they want to get a hold of you somehow, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. You can contact the Eden House at 216-281-7751. You can email me directly at sarah.murphy at the Edenhouse.org. You heard it here first, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Chris. Peace out. Thank you, everyone.